First of all, I would like to thank Professor Kellens, Professor Brian, because uh, their names is so strongly linked to the Collège de France, this institute, uh, and the, st the study of the Achaemenid and Iranian history, language, and also heritage. So it's uh, an honor for, for me to be here. Let me thank also Céline Redar for her efforts in the organization of this conference. I, I will talk about a bronze plaque found in the so-called treasury of Persepolis and written in Hilama. So I will call it the Persepolis bronze plaque. It is dated in the range between the 8th and the 6th centuries BC. The highest date has been proposed by Hinz and Hoch the lowest one at the beginning of the Achaemenid period by Engelmann and myself. Uh, Professor Stolper was the first to suggest a date in uh, the 6th century. Uh, it is uh, a peculiar artifact which is well known since the text mentions a man and a place that are attested together also in a tablet from the Persepolis fortification archive. The man is Ururu or Aururu, maybe, the place is Gizat, or maybe Kesat, and the tablet is PF 352, as you can see. The interest of this coincidence is increased by the fact that Aururu is qualified as Shatin on uh, line 3, uh, that is Cult Officiant in PF 352, and also in another tablet. Both these tablets are part of the dossier of administrative accounts related to provisions for cultic activity studied by uh, Henkelmann in his book The Other Gods Who Are, and also in uh, some other very useful and interesting art article. Among these cultic activities, the one called Ship, Attested in nine text and journal entries in the Persepolis uh, fortification tablets seems to be a sacrificial feast involving the highest authorities of the Persepolis economic management. Needless to say, a ship is mentioned in uh, the bronze plaque from Persepolis. Both the ship of the Persepolis tablets and the ship of the bronze plaque are preceded by the divine determinative uh, determinative, uh, an, year or dingy, as you prefer, that is uh, the semantic classifier used before the names of gods and other divine-related features or objects. The relevance of the bronze plaque as a source for the Achaemenid religion, intended as the ideological exhibited cults practiced by the dynasty, stems mainly from these coincidences and their interpretation. Are the bronze plaque and PF 352 related to the same man whose name was Aururo? Or is it a case of homonymy? In the latter case, could the two Aururo belong to the same family, surely representative of the elite, maybe landowners, cult officiants, or administrators, perhaps in a town called Kesat or Gizat? Moreover, is the ship attested in the Persepolis bronze plaque, the same cultic activity attested in the fortification tablets as ship? Is it recorded in the bronze plaque for pur purposes more or less similar to the accounting needs of the fortification tablets? My aim here is to investigate the text of the bronze plaque, which is still unpublished, and which I had the opportunity to study, to study at the National Museum of Iran in Tehran in 2010 in the framework of the Dar Darius project uh, directed by Professor uh, Adriano Rossi. I will try also to understand uh, which purpose had the mention of gods in the plaque with respect to the function of the plaque itself. The formal characteristics and the length of the text of the plaque make it an, an, an outstanding artifact. Even if the text is only partially understood, the combination of these two features makes clear that we are facing something quite different from the usual royal inscriptions or administrative tablets written in Elamite language. 
the text was impressed on the two faces of a bronze plaque me measuring circa 21 by 32 by a half a centimeter, and the weight is three kilograms and a half. A chain was fixed to the two hands of the upper edge, suggesting that the plaque was devised to be hung on a wall. A pseudo ceiling was drawn upside down on the reverse, that is, with the same orientation of the text on the obverse, since the plaque was written like a tablet. The obverse was face up, uh, sorry, the plaque was found among charred matters on the floor of room 56 of the so called Treasury of Persepolis. The obverse, the obverse was face up and therefore the reverse is preserved better than the obverse, which suffered probably the high temperatures of the combustion of beams fallen from the ceiling. It seems that recently, after its discovery and uh, the subsequent cleaning at the Oriental Institute of Chicago, someone tried to remove a wide encrustation on the obverse with a chisel. This encrustation is actually the heat inflated and melted surface, uh, surface of the plaque, which therefore was inadvertently and inexpertly removed without finding anything underneath. And uh, here is a comparison with uh, the gold foundation tablet of uh, Sargon at Korsabat, which suffered eating too in uh, the upper part, as you can see as, uh, in, as comparison. In some small parts, the heat inflated surface chipped away, leaving in view the underlying inner core, and it seems that the plaque was made in two steps, first producing the core and letting, in, and letting it harden, then enveloping it in a further layer of bronze, which was impressed with the chisel when it was still soft. The inner core was not entirely hardened, and the wedge impressions affected also its hidden surface in correspondence to the small areas where the inner core surface is exposed. These details are relevant for the understanding of the function of the text, but I don't linger on them since they are, uh, they are discussed in a previous article of mine published in the volume Susa and Delam, uh, edited by Jan Tavernier and Catherine de, Catherine de Graaf. So here, just a small... Uh, gallery of uh, Elamite artifact in uh, uh, bronze uh, here at the Louvre, with all these artifacts are inscribed, but uh, these, uh, as you can see also at foresight, are quite different from the Persepolis bronze plaque. An interesting formal parallel is provided instead by a metal plaque from Hattuja, and it is, uh, to my knowledge, the only extant inscribed bronze artifact from the Hittite world. It was discovered by chance during restoration work on the city wall in 1986 in a pit underneath the street pavement. Its size, as you can see, is comparable, uh, they are in scale, to, uh, is comparable to the Persepolis bronze plaque, which is just a little uh, small, smaller. The reverse is uh, written upside down with respect to the obverse, like an ordinary tablet, and uh, in the same way of the bronze plaque from Persepolis. The plaque was hung, hung by means of two chains passing through the holes and held there by the different size of the, by the different size of the ending link. The text published by Otten represents a treaty between Hittite king Tutkaliya IV, and we are in the 13th century BC, and Kurunta, king of Tarkuntasha. The ending of the text is noteworthy since it is explicitly stated that the tablet was written in seven exemplars and sealed with two seal, uh, seals named after gods. As you can see, this tablet is compiled in several exemplars and has been sealed with the seal of the sun goddess of Arina and with the seal of the weather god of Hati. Notwithstanding this statement, the plaque, the plaque itself is not sealed, but it is interesting to compare it to the bronze plaque from Persepoli, which is actually sealed with the incised the pseudo ceilings that we have seen before. The text continues with the list of the seven exemplars, which is also interesting, 
one tablet in front of the sun goddess of Arina, one tablet in, in front of the weather god, etc. Kurunta, king of the country of Tarkuntasha, keeps, keeps one tablet in his house. This formula is known also from other Itai treaties and attests the practice to place this document in front of the god, that is, in the temple dedicated to that god. This practice, applied to status or stela, stile, is attested also by Middle Hilamite royal inscriptions, for example, in the formula Ir Sian Mur Tach, I placed him, that is, an image or a statue of a certain god, in the temple. In another Itaid treaty, a formula with the verb to hang is explicitly used, confirming that the chain of the plaque was functional to the display of the text. It is noteworthy that from the Itaid war we have also proofs for land grants and fidelity oaths put on display in temples. The Itaid metal plaque represents an interesting comparison from a formal point of view. It suggests that also the bronze plaque from Persepolis could be modeled in bronze to be placed in a temple or some other institu institution, like the palace of the king or a local lord. The taxes should be related in some way to a commitment or obligation taken by an high rank entity, be it a person or a family, towards another high rank entity or institution in front of a more or less defined third party. Therefore, we should expect uh, for the Persepolis plaque a treaty, a land grant, or a list of prebends. Due to the durability and uh, solidity of the writing support, it goes without saying that the text had a legal value and could not be a simple administrative uh, transaction. Now, I would like to uh, briefly introduce you uh, to the textual structure of uh, the plaque from Persepolis. The first line of text on the obverse are wholly lost for a height corresponding to 13 or 14 lines, but we cannot be sure that all were actually inscribed. Cameron believed that the pseudo ceiling was drawn here too, and in truth, in correspondence with the, and the, um, uh, in truth, one can see bits of carved lines and no cuneiform signs in the teeny areas where the original surf surface seems to have been preserved, just uh, near the, the center of this uh, uh, picture. 46 lines of text are still partly or entirely visible after the wholly damaged area in the lower part of uh, the plaque. And uh, here is... Uh, a small surprise for a philologist, maybe, uh, during my first ex examination of the bronze plaque in 2010, I was able, able to find, uh, it was very clear in truth, a further line of text on the lower edge, as in a clay tablet, uh, the text continued here and then uh, on the reverse. The general uh, the general understanding of the text uh, is hindered by the damaged areas and by the high number of apax legomena. The latter characteristic seems to confirm that we are dealing with a textual genre otherwise unknown in the extant Ilamite uh, documentation. Here we have uh, the reverse, uh, which is, uh, as I told, uh, upside down. And uh, you can see the line of text are better preserved here then there is a small uh, uh, five uh, blank lines, and then uh, the colophon, uh, the uh, line before the pseudo ceiling, which is, uh, as you can see, upside down into, in, in turn, uh, in the same orientation of uh, the uh, obverse. Uh, besides the problem of uh, lexicon and uh, readability of uh, the signs, um, I have to say that the treatment of the paleography of the plaque in uh, Steve's syllabary, which is an, the, an excellent op work and a reference for, for us, is not uh, satisfactory. Steve collated the text in Tehran and made a drawing of it, but evidently and unfortunately, the drawings of the signs for the syllabary were made before the collation and were not updated afterwards, at least I think so. As an example, compare the drawing of the sign Da or Ta Tu in the syllabary to its instances um, on the plaque. 
which are systematic like uh, this uh, two that you can see uh, here one and the other one here the main section of the text seems to extend from the last quarter of the ob obverse to the first quarter of the reverse. It is represented by a pattern occurring three times with some fixed and some changing elements. Among the fixed elements, there are four syntax mentioning a different im, wind, the logogram for wind in, Acad in Acadian. In the following order, im shooting, im atin, im kurme, im come now with, with some logograms. Each of these im is followed by e tumpak, uh, which uh, is a verbal base, the verbal base tumpa, which uh, is attested also in the Middle Amite inscription. And one uh, occurrence is particularly interesting because uh, it is in, a, in an inscription from Chogazambil, which is virtually a uh, bilingual. So you can uh, check the text. Uh, we have no, no much time now, but uh, the correspondence is with the, the a form of the verb epeju, to make in, uh, in Acadian. Anyway, it is not so simple because of the interlinguistic comparison has to deal with the entire syntax, which, uh, which has some lexical and word parsing issues in Elamite, unfortunately. After that, some words of difficult interpretation can be written, followed by some varying toponyms marked with the proposed so-called so locative determinative ash, and then follows uh, tala e, with uh, the third singular person possessive suffix, which closes each of these uh, syntax. Uh, this syntax, uh, syntax have been isolated as such on the ground of their repetition. Since uh, the winds can be deified and cited as a group of four in Mesopotamian rituals and incantation, Inthenkok proposed a translation like the following one, is a sacrifice, tala, talae, has been offered to the wind of the mountains, the northern wind, maybe. My interpretation is a little bit different, just like François Vallat. Uh, there are also some other indications by Koch and uh, Inthen Koch uh, for the meaning of tala um, as uh, tax or levy in the dictionary, in their dictionary. In my opinion, the simple solution is to consider the four im as cardinal points, just like Akkadian sharu, which is uh, wind, but also cardinal point, and uh, uh, the, moreover, the cardinal points uh, are ordered according to the Mesopotamian tradition. So we have south, shooting, north, east, and west. The name of the south cardinal point uh, sorry, derives from its Akkadian name, which is Shutu. So shooting and Shutu, it's the same. Kur clearly indicates the east, in my opinion, the, that is uh, the mountainous land in a Mesopotamian and also a Susian point uh, uh, perspective from a Mesopotamian point of view. The presence of toponyms after Tumpak supports this interpretation. So, in my opinion, we are dealing here with lands, and the Talae is a reference to their boundaries according to the four cardinal points. Each repeti repetition of the entire pattern, including the four im syntagms, correspond to a single land. To a single land. This uh, boundary pattern seems to be followed by a, a re recapitulating, re recapitulating section opened by the sign pap, summing up something in sum, followed by other toponyms in turn followed by so, some problematical words, and then by i hupa sha, which is a, a verbal form that we know from the Bizotun inscription with the meaning of to follow, to follow the, uh, the law. But it's very difficult for me to um, find the exact meaning here. So the understanding of this pattern is the key for the understanding of the entire text, since also the excellent parts of the second and third quarters of the obverse seems to fit in this pattern. It is interesting to note, therefore, that we are not dealing here with offerings to gods, as uh, uh, suggested Hintz and Hawke, this is my opinion at least, and note also that him, him is not preceded by the divine classifier An, so it should not be uh, a god like Adad or something like this. 
Uh, no, go, no God is mentioned in the extant text of the plaque till line 11 on the reverse. Here the above, me the above mentioned cultic activity called Shup is mentioned. Here is uh, the, the passage. On the established day of the month Rahal, may Shashu, my goddess, re receive Shup as offering recompensation. Both the reading which I have collated on the plaque and the translation presented here follow the, one, the ones proposed and commented by Henkelmann, except for some minor details. For example, the addition of established is based on a suggestion by Gracia Giovinazzo. The context is different from the occurrences of ship in the Persepolis tablets, where it is nearly always attested, attested as an object of, of the verb uta, to make, but this may be due to the different textual gender. Moreover, the ship attested in the Persepolis fortification tablets is not related to a specified god, except in one instance with this cura. In the plaque, the cultic activity is connected to the rarely attested goddess Shashum, or Shashum, known since the Treaty of Naramsin, a text of the third millennium. The female character of this deity is assured by old Babylonian nomastics from Susiana, and uh, here you have some uh, example with uh, the female uh, determinative. Uh, Shashum is not attested in the tablets from Persepolis, nor in the neo hilamite Acropolis tablet from Susa. Anyway, uh, this, uh, uh, the, then follow a passage that uh, is uh, very interesting, in my opinion, because we have uh, a, a number of uh, given items, uh, among which one can find mushen, bird, tea, arrow, kubaba, silver, udunita, sheep, goat, and uh, these uh, names um, suggest that it is a list of uh, offering of some goods that uh, uh, are given to, to someone, and in a case, uh, one of these uh, name or offerings is followed by uh, uh, the name of the god Napirisha, preceded by the divine classifier. So this uh, connection um, reminds me of uh, some Acropolis tablets from Susa, near my text, late near my text, such as MDP 912, where a given number of bows, ban, here in the text, arrows, apti, shafts uh, of, of arrows, gi, on the first line, and heroveds, sach, were received, tush, or duish, as you prefer, by the god Shazi of Halik. And uh, in uh, other tablets, uh, we have uh, some other gods. For example, in, uh, in uh, MDP 910, we have the god Shimut, and uh, it is interest interesting that it is followed also uh, like uh, Shazi before, uh, Shazi Halikra, line 5-6 of the first text, Shimut in the second text is followed by a place name, Kadanura, Kadanu, ha R is the way to connect the two, the two names, so Shimut of Kadanu, Shazi of Halik. And uh, this in, it's uh, in, interesting in my view. In other cases, uh, only Nap, God is written and we don't know if it was the God or a God. So here are some examples and in, in all these cases you can see Tush or Dush, so he received, this God received uh, the goods that are listed there. So Shashum is attested other three times on the Persepolis bronze plaque and uh, is it, she is followed also by a title, just like uh, the case of uh, Shazi and uh, Shimut, and this title is uh, Sh uh, Shashu Keshatira, so Shashum of Kesat or Kaisat, which is uh, a place which is attested elsewhere in the Persepolis uh, fortification tablets beside uh, the uh, bronze plaque. This latter epithet seems to confirm the centrality of Kesat among the other toponyms mentioned in the bronze plaque, and it's important also from a ritual point of view. Now, the concluding section uh, starts on line 27, and one can read Hat Napirisha Nakunte Ak Shashum Helkalaer, another kind of uh, apposition uh, epithet. Napir Ur, my God, Shashum, my God, and then I would restore 
Tacni. So uh, reading the, the entire translation that I suggest, the punishing staff of Napirisha, Nahunte, and Shashum, my goddess, may be placed over him who will damage uh, my, my building, my, my works, whatever I have done. Two interpretations have been proposed for Hat, which is known also from some Middle Elamite royal inscriptions, where it introduces the consequences of evil deeds perpetrated against uh, the object dedicated to a certain god through the inscription. The first is a loan from Akkadian Hatu, Painic, Fear, or from Akkadian Hatu, with the, the emphatic T, Scepter or Staff. The latter choice has been suggested by the wood tool classifier, Gish, attested only in this uh, occurrence in uh, the Persepolis bronze plaque. This formula therefore introduces an elaborate uh, course against uh, who will damage the text or will not respect maybe its statements, its legal statements. I have to omit here a section that uh, I have uh, um, share, shared in, uh, the in the version of the paper that I sent to the organizers, uh, that is the hypothesis that Aururo is uh, an Iranian name. And anyway, I will be uh, happy to receive your comments, your critics uh, afterwards about this uh, hypothesis. I am obviously not sure. And I think we have to distinct uh, uh, Iranian to be Aururo as a uh, an Iranian, uh, linguistically Iranian name and uh, as, uh, uh, as the ethnic appartenance of uh, uh, Ururu, the people, the person itself. So, uh, the Persepolis bronze plaque uh, seems to stem from a cultural context different from the one attested by the Persepolis tablet or the Camelid rolling inscriptions. The lexicon and the textual formulas find comparisons in the Middle and Elamite inscription. Uh, and uh, uh, the mention of God gods goes back to the old Middle Elamite tradition. And the paleography can be compared also to neo hilamite texts, like uh, some tablets from Susa. Anyway, this may be uh, due only to the different textual genres of uh, the documents from Persepolis and the document uh, from uh, uh, Susa. So we, mm, we, I think that we have to search for similarities between the bronze plaque, uh, the bronze plaque and the fortification tablets, especially in onomastic. As you can see, there are some points of connection uh, between the bronze plaque and the Persepolis fortification tablet. Several similarities can be found also with the late uh, Nilamai tablets, again, the name Arur and some other details. In my view, the Persepolis bronze plaque uh, uh, represents uh, the display counterparts of the Persepolis fortification tablets, recording offerings to the gods. Uh, just two minutes if I can, sorry. More specifically, it is the official and prescriptive document in the frame of which single offerings had to be more or less regularly performed. I am not stating that uh, the bronze plaque and the Persepolis fortification tablets refer to the same offerings, nor that they are contemporary, but that the actual offerings to the gods mentioned in the Persepolis tablets had probably to be established by documents similar to the bronze plaque. This leads us, leads us to another relevant issue. The offerings had to be founded and justified in some ways. So it is clear that the offerings uh, to a god were not rituals having an end in themselves, uh, and that among the many typologies of offerings, offerings, at least some were used for feasting and or for paying taxes or services. The very need to qualify a god with a toponym or some other identification seems to confirm that the heavenly gods were also, or especially, unearthly and mundane matter. Thank you very much.